one of the main applications, and if um, you take, you know, uh, Calc 2 and physics and calculus-based physics can be a co-rec, which is why Calc 2 covers vectors at the beginning of it, because you do vectors. Uh, if you think of linear algebra, you know, mathematically, a lot of times, again, we started with trying to solve systems of equations. If you start it with a physics mindset, everything is about spaces. It's like, and it's not, in particular, like for us, spaces have been brought up when we said, you know, what's a vector space? Vector space is a set of objects. Again, normally these objects are going to be called typically vectors, since it's the most classic example called V. And then we have two operators where addition is defined, scalar multiplication is defined, and 10 axioms hold. Roughly speaking, the 10 axioms, the first two axioms are closure, that when we start working with our objects, it stays within our set of objects. We don't go to new things. If I put a chair with a chair, it does not become a dog. Chair, chair, stays chair, right? And so vector, vector, stays vector of the type we're talking about. And then we have four axioms about addition, and we have four axioms about multiplication. The four axioms of addition are the fact you have Commutativity, associativity, you have an additive identity, you have an additive inverse, and then for multiplication, you have distribution, two of them, an associative form, and then also one times it is just one times a vector is a vector, so it's a multiplicative identity. If all those true, we're, not only we have a space, we have a vector space. And so it's a nice space. Right? It has this ability to form new things from other things, and we can put them together. And all of the ones that we've talked about so far is classic vectors. And if you go to, I think it's like one brown tree blue, one of the other professors has his students watch these uh, introduction to linear algebra using just the arrow diagrams and the number representations and saying, here, how else does this all work, and how do we think about it? And you watch binge watch 16 some hours of it as an intro, right? And it's one of the things that you you can do, right? Especially if they're somewhat entertaining and they have some nice animations, right? But for us, we have this nice idea of being able to get around the objects we're interested in. And how do you get around? Stretch and add. And if those things work, what you call your add and what you call your stretch, satisfy those ax axioms, we call it a vector space. Now, one of the things that in logic and in mathematics in particular that we have is a particular technique. Called induction. Induction usually has some two names, like strong induction, weak induction. It's also not only is this called induction, it's sometimes called recursion. Now the idea behind induction, or sometimes we talk about recursion, as a tool that you would work with is it has two things that occur. The first thing is you talk about some given set of <coughs> starting objects. This is normally called the basis. So you start off with something. And then what we do, so this is kind of like the kickoff part. What makes us recursive or what makes us inductive is that we have what's called the inductive step, the recursive step. And what this says is that I can make new things from my old things following some sort of rule of making this happen. All right, here would be a physical example. How does weather models do what they do? You simply say things like, what's the temperature tomorrow? What's the temperature after that? What's the temperature after that? How does this work? Well, what they do is they have a time-based system. They go out and they have a basis, which is run outside and collect a bunch of temperatures and pressures and wind velocities, and you have values. Then what you do is you put it into a system. So these are the first and outcome values, and you consider that, well, this is part of my system again, 
So what can I do? Well, I say I put in today's values, it goes through this, out comes the other side, there's a bunch of temperatures, and I say, hey, that's tomorrow. Well, how do I get two days? I take my tomorrow, dump it back into my system, out will come the next day. Right? That's a time, a iterative-based event. That's how we do recursion. You just have in, out, back in, out, back in, out. You just keep doing it over and over again, and it forms a larger space. It's a collection of stuff, everything that'll form. And that idea of that process is we're going to take, say, the old objects and make new ones. And this is our inductive or recursive steps. The process of this is, well, what do you mean by make? The make's going to be, it's like, well, um, this is the thing that I'm going to bring along with me. If I'm going to do weather, what's make? It's going to be a, a mathematical representation of values come in, spits out new weather values. So it's going to talk about things like fluid dynamics, how, how temperatures flow through the system and the energies and everything else. Right? And you just simply put it in and out comes out the next values and then you put it back in and you keep going. If I want to go really simple, say example, my basis is an element in my set, I'll call it V is the number five. And now my inductive step will be if an element is in my space, say element one, and maybe you had an el another element, call it element two, is in your space. Maybe I should use S for space. Instead of B. Then I'll do element one plus element two is allowed, and maybe element one minus element two is allowed. So what do I do? Hey, if you have elements, how do I get new ones? Add or subtract them. What would this make? What's one element we have? It's a start. And so then now we think about feeding. What, what can I put into it? Five. So what can, what can I do? I can make five plus five. What else could I do? Five minus five. And these are going to be still part of my set. So I put, if I put five in and another five in, I'll plug them back in because five are in my set. And so if I would do this process, I would start off with five, but then what would come out? Well, I'd get, if I did five plus five, all of a sudden I would have 10. If I did five minus five, I would now have zero, but I still had what? So what's my new set? Well, now what can I do? I can feed it in. Hmm. What would this form? What could I do? I could do 10 plus 10. I could do 10 plus 5. I could do 10 plus 0. Who cares? <laughs> What's 10 plus 10? 20. So if we would do this again, <coughs> I could have 20. I could have, what's 10 plus 5? 15, I would still have 10, I would still have 5, I would still have 0. What is 0 minus 5? Negative 5, so that would have to be in my set. What is 0 minus 10? Negative 10. Anybody catch the pattern? If I would continue, what's S going to be? all multiples of 5. So how did I define all multiples of 5? This here, this little rule, generates all multiples of 5. So I have an infinite set, multiples of 5, from negative infinity to infinity. This entire infinite set can be made by following these rules. That's how induction works. Right? Start with something, 
give me some sort of rule to make new things, and those new things are part of your set, just keep on going and figure out inductively to find your set. And so you can imagine, like, you know, we have models of weather. How does this work, right? Why do we say things like 50% chance? Well, one of the things that you have to do on this is you go out and you take temperatures, and you assume they're all wrong. And then you take modifications of those temperatures. Well, they could be this, these modifications, or they could be these modifications. So you move them to nearest values. And then you run all of those as inputs through, and then you look at all possible outputs. And if you notice that, well, 50% of the time it rains. So what should I say for tomorrow? Eh, it's probably 50% chance of rain. And then you do it again and again and again. Now, one of the things we know for systems is we start to study this sort of stuff. The way that you put it together is this causing outputs that may cause issues. Like one of the things that happens is, uh, for us, you know, we have the number five and it's the number five. So it's pretty easy to generate multiples of five. In the real world, you say five, but it's actually not, right? You measure something and you say five, it's actually not five. It's five with error. Nothing you measure is right. It's always wrong. So if I have error, if there's an error here and an error here and I add it, what's going to happen? My error gets bigger. But if I feed that back in, what happens again? It gets worse. <laughs> so then you have to study, oh man, this is it's not going to be my set. How does this work? And so when we do processes of this nature, we have to worry about it. So this is a tool that's used in math. So now we're going to go back to sets, and we're going to understand this. You know, we have this tool that's available to us. That's something that we can make things out. And maybe we'll do another example of this tool. Let's say your basis is made up of 0 and 1. And I'll say that the a sub 0 is 0, a sub 1 is 1. Let's just use that notation. And now my inductive rule is that if you want to make something new, you take the one right before it, take the one even older than that, and add them together. You want to make something new? We'll take what's, well, who's right before it, and then who's before that. Add those two numbers, and you'll get the next number. If we apply this, if you do it, what are we going to get? We're going to get 0, 1, one. one two, two, three, five. which is the what? Fibonacci sequence. What's nice about recursion is it allows you to construct things. If the big part of recursion always is the rule of construction. In other words, you look at the system and you think about, I think this world is built up of old stuff somehow come together to make new for the thing that you're analyzing. And you'd assume that maybe is true for weather. That current values of stuff somehow come together according to particular rules. Heat flows like this. Things that bump into each other of this pressure and this density flow like that. And you look at these sorts of things and they seem to follow particular rules. And so the study of that allows you to create next iterations. A closed function goes past that and says, no, I'm not interested in an iterative event. I just want to tell me, just have something that, I, that, you know, if we would have something like a doubling rule. If I would have my basis and start off with the very first object you have is the number one, and then my inductive rule it's just simply, hey, you want to get new values, just take your old value and multiply it by 2. And so what are we going to get? 1, 2, Now, the nice thing about this is, is if your world is understanding that I, I have a reason of why I'm multiplying it by 2. This is called, it's an open form, which means it's iterative. On the other hand, if you could make the same thing with a closed rule, which would be a function, which is simply that what is this? The sequence is 2 to the power of n minus 1. 
So what's two to what is a? Oh, wait a second. What did I start off here? Zero. Oh, so it's two to the end. Make sure I start off in the right value. If I plug a zero in, what do I get? Plug a one in, I get a. Okay. What's nice about closed rules? Hey, what's the one thousandth thing? Well, if the zero is this here, right, zero plug in zero, the one thousandth you would plug in, right? We would go up here and anybody? That was n equal zero, n equal one, n equal two, n equal three, n equal four, right? But zero is the first. So the fifth guy you plug in four. So the thousandth guy you would plug in, 999. So 2 to the 999 power would give you that. Well, that's nice because closed, you just jump straight to the answer. right? If I had a closed rule for weather, what happens 1,000 days from now? Plug in 999 and that'll be the weather. What is iterative? You've got to generate all. <laughs> you need everybody in front before you can get the next. Yes? Mm -hmm. you decide on two rather than like three or one or 17? Um, there's multiple ways to get closed rules. One, guess. And you guess and check. <laughs> and so how do you guess and check? If you guess two to the n, what's a sub n? That's two to the n. What's a sub n minus one? That's two to the n minus one. So what's two times two to the n minus one? Is that two to the n? Yes, it worked. Guess and check. Another one is an iterative process of studying sequences and series enough to start to see the patterns, which is called forward iteration or backwards iteration. But what about, how did, how did you decide the two originally like, for, for the Oh, you just make it up. This was just a problem I made up. Oh, okay. If I wanted a tripling problem or if I wanted Fibonacci numbers, like a closed formula for the Fibonacci numbers that would be, let me see here, one, plus 1 over radical 5 over to the n minus 1 over radical 5 times 1 minus 1 over radical 5. All right. And you can, there's ways to go ahead and prove also, which is funny, is that there's a closed formula for Fibonacci numbers. When you look at this, if I remember it right, square root of 5 is purely irrational. 1 over square root of 5 is purely irrational. This thing on the inside is the golden ratio and the inverse of the golden ratio, which is purely irrational. So I have an ira purely irrational with an irrational to an integer power minus an irrational with another irrational to an integer power that spits out a int, a Fibonacci int. One of the things you prove, but anyways. But just, you need to take discrete one and two to do that one. Anyways, so closed formulas are good. Open formulas are more common. Because most of the time when we look and we model things, we model things like, oh wait, those came together to make something new, and you figure out the rule of why it happened. Now, that happens for us in the next thing that we're going to study. 3.2. So, you have a space. It's a vector space. So collection of stuff. So we have all the possible stuff that would ever exist here. The vector spaces have with it. Not only do you have V, you also have to define that I understand what addition is. I understand which, what scalar multiplication is. Vector spaces have their operators that come along. If I say you have a vector space, that means that you know the axioms work. <laughs> it's like, I don't have to prove it. You told me, or like, I've already proved it. So in the back of my mind, closure's here. Everything's fine. Right, so something like that happens. One of the questions that you could have is, for this larger space, is there something in it? So for example, uh, this room is three-dimensional, but this projector screen is two, right? So I can have spaces in spaces. You can look at a book, right? It's three-dimensional. But every page is two. So we have all of these different two-dimensional things that are embedded within this. We also have one-dimensional things. There's a line, so there's a string at the bottom of this projector screen. That's a one-dimensional object that's embedded within three-space. 
Now, one of the things that we would have is, sure, this is a thing that's inside this larger one. Is this one here in such a way that if I was given stuff in it and I followed the rules, that I would combine these guys, it would always stay in this space S. So, like for example, on this flat board, if I have objects on this 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 screen, I would have a vector on this screen, like what we're looking at. I have a vector on the screen, and I have a vector on the screen, which is embedded in three-dimensional space, right? But if I keep taking these things and shrinking them and adding them, does it stay on the board? Have you ever seen me draw anything that came out into the room? No. Everything I drew on the board stayed on the board. So it's closed. One of the other things happens is like, well, it's, it's within here, so those still hold. All those axioms of, is it still commutative? Of course. It's still using the same rules. It's still commutative. It's still associative. It still has it. Well, there's actually one thing that we may have to worry about a little bit. But it looks like this space is probably also a vector space that's in a vector space. It's kind of like having people seen Russian dolls. That nest a doll in a doll. In a doll. Right? Are they all still the same? Well, it's like, do they all still satisfy the same rules? And so what we're going to be looking for is, is this thing, which is obviously a subset. It's a subset, right? I'm taking some of the stuff from the bigger stuff. But is it a special one? So I'm going to look for a very special subset. I want to take anything so that this all works. And the anything that would satisfy the following definition. S, a non-empty subset of V, such that I'm just going to take just like random stuff, I'm going to take something special here, such that the following is true. One, if x is in S, then alpha x is in S. Two, if x is in S, y is in S, then x plus y is in S. Let's go ahead and call S a subspace of V. So I want to take something such that if everybody within the special thing that I'm collecting combined stays within what I'm collecting, then that will be a subspace. Now, we have two obvious ones. V is a subspace of V. All sets are a subset of themselves. So what do you take? I'm just going to take everybody. All right, that's kind of trivial. <laughs> I wanted something that wasn't everybody. OK, so that's the first one that's kind of obvious. The second one is, what are you going to take? I'm only going to take the origin. <coughs> what are you take? I'm going to take the zero vector. Why is that closed? Well, if I take a zero plat vector plus a zero vector, it's still the zero vector. If I take a zero vector and multiply it by something, it is still the <coughs> zero vector. Uh, this is pretty obviously that, yes, it's a subset. I took one. It's not empty. I have at least one thing. Right? This is a subspace of V as well. Normally this guy gets its own name. It's called the zero subspace. So these are the trivial ones. We're not going to be looking for them. I want more than this. What I want, everybody else is going to be a proper subspace. 
So how to show S is a subspace of V. Along with any vector space comes its operators. Since the operators already satisfy those eight axioms, the ones that make it different is the closure property. Right? The eight axioms are, hey, in my entire vector space, I have associativity, I have commutativity, I have, and there's gonna be another little flag here a little bit, which is it needs a zero object. Right? and it needs to be able to find an additive inverse given that zero object, et cetera. So if I'm going to show that this is a subspace, we're just going to use the fact S is also a vector space. Because if you could show it to be closed and all those other axioms hold, it's going to be a vector space. So if you have a vector space, the biggest issue is going to be one, it needs to be non-empty. It has to have something. But what is, for all the elements that you could have, and when you look at those normal rules, which is the one that's probably the most important one that you'd want to check right away, do you have anybody, would be you need the zero. At minimum, you must have the zero vector. And so what you have to do is, one, you would check non-empty. So just check for the easiest, which is the zero vector. It needs it anyway, so it's like, check this one. Hey, look, it doesn't have the zero vector. It's not going to be a subspace. The second thing that you would look for is check in the yeah, last thing, which is check the two closure properties. That V plus U still has to be an S and alpha V still has to be an S. If I give you stuff in S and you add them, it stays in S. In other words, it doesn't start to do like here. I've been, everything I've been drawing two-dimensionally stayed two-dimensional. Didn't all of a sudden pop out into the room as a three-dimensional object. Now think about, instead of having a flat plane, what would happen if you had a curved plane? <coughs> you would start to come out, right? If I would have these two vectors, like if this thing was bent, if you had had a plane that had a bend to it, and you would take, say, this vector and this vector and put them together, right? The plane bends away. Those vectors are within the space itself, but when I have some sort of effect to it, it's possible that this thing just simply goes out of where it's supposed to be. And the answer is no, that can't be. Closure properties won't hold. So how do we check for things like that. We'll give you some examples. Let's say vector space that I'm talking about is the two by two matrices. So any two by two matrix would look like what? It would be, say, A, B, C, D, right? For any real numbers, right? So that's my entire space. Now I'm going to say that S is going to be made up of this number and this number are going to be the same, but this number and this number are negatives of each other. So give me an example of something 
So let's have a matrix here. Matrix A, that would be in S. Give me a number, just plug in some numbers that would be in S. Five. So, yeah, to five. so five, two, two, two negative, five. negative five. This is obviously in S. Give me an example of not in S. Five, two, 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 two five. five. Right? It's like, oh, it's almost, no, no, those are supposed to be opposite negatives, right? I'll say, those are opposite signs, these are the same number, right? Same numbers, but opposite signs, same numbers. Are obviously anything that looks in S, right, is embedded in a two by two. There's a bunch of other matrices that are not, there's a bunch of matrices that are. So I'm going to use my normal, what do I do? I know how to add matrices, and I know how to scale or multiply matrices. I'll use those as my normal operators. So the first thing to check, so what are we going to do? Is S a vector space? So you imagine the space of every possible 2 by 2 matrix that would ever exist. We're only going to take the ones where these two numbers are the same, and these two numbers are the additive inverse of each other. So I'm taking a subset of them. Is S a subspace? Well, what do I check? The first thing is I need to check zero. What's the zero of R22 space? What's, a two by, what's the zero of two by two matrices? So is the big O, 0, 0, 0, 0, in <coughs> S? Are these numbers the same? Yes. Are these numbers additive inverses? Yes. So, yes. It at least has a zero object. Second thing, I need to say closure. So what do I do? What's closure? I need to check V plus U, and I need to check alpha V. Give me a, so we'll handle this guy first. What's an arbitrary two by two look like? Uh, it was something, 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 negative reciprocal. And I'm gonna add an arbitrary one. The C, D, D minus C. <laughs> Everybody okay with that? Now what happens if I would add these numbers? What would I get? B plus C. A plus D. A plus D. A negative B plus C. Are those the same number? Are those additive inverses? Is that in S? Yes, this is in S. True. Everybody okay with that? So I would, if I had, so far I know that if I have some matrix that's like 5, 2, 2, negative 5, or pi, 3, 3, negative pi, if I plug it together, it would be number, 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 uh, negative number, right? It would be the same pattern. It stays within my space. Now I have to check what? What would alpha V look like? Well, that would look like what? Alpha times, give me an arbitrary matrix, uh, B, A, A minus B. What would that look like? Alpha B, alpha A, alpha A minus alpha B. Are those the same number? Are those additive inverses? Yes, this is also true. So what have I just shown? The collection of matrices where the non dot the do we have the prime diagonal and the secondary diagonal. The secondary diagonal is the same. This diagonal is of negative reciprocal sorry, additive inverses. 
stay within the same elements. It's closed. It has a zero element. Guess what? It's a subspace. So you'd imagine your space to be all collections of two by twos. This special collection is also a vector space as well. And it's a subspace within the other. So what's left to happen is how do we handle every one of these problems? You have to ask, what are your objects? What are the operators? And you have to have a way of representing your objects, arbitrary versions of it, because you're going to eventually be adding and stretching and say, does it say, stay same type? And if any of these was no, for example, what if all of a sudden I would say, if is all three term polynomials with the constant term equal to one a subspace of P three. First off, what is anything in P3? What does P3 represent? It represents three term polynomials. Give me an arbitrary three term polynomial. Without numbers. <laughs> Say A plus BX plus CX squared, or if we wanted to, we could have written cx squared plus bx plus a, depending if you want to go up or down. This will be important. You have to be careful on some problems. They'll go to the answer in the back of the book and they write upwards and sometimes they write downwards and they're only writing the coefficients, so you have to be careful. Like, which way did you? Because order matters to me. <laughs> so if you're not giving me the x's, which way did you go? So be careful sometimes. And it's sometimes, even in the same section, whoever he had solved the solutions on the back flipped it. It's like, oh. Anyways, so something like that. On the other hand, what's S? What would this look like? What's the main difference here? What am I saying? I want a three-term polynomial. I just want the first thing to be a 1. So this is a 1 plus something x plus something x squared. So I don't care what the other two are. So it could be 1 plus 0x plus 0x squared. 1 plus pi x plus the square root of 3 x squared, all right? I don't care what those other numbers are. It has to be a one. Obviously, this is a subset. So it's just one of those. And actually, it's many of those, depending if we pick different values. And notice that this a, this b, and this b, and this c, and this c are not the same thing. Those just represent any real number, but they're different from each other. So if I want to check for subspace, what's the first thing we check for? Zero. What's the zero object of P3? Zero, zero plus? Zero, zero, six, six. Guess what? Is that an S? No. <coughs> Done. Right? Not a subspace. I don't even need to check the other ones. I could easily check the other ones if I want. Um, to what if I tried closure? Just to do it. Let's say you wanted to go further. What would one polynomial plus another polynomial in S look like? What would be an arbitrary first polynomial be? One plus something x plus something x squared. What's an arbitrary different one? 1 plus something x plus something x squared. Why am I using different letters? Because they're, <laughs> they're just arbitrary numbers. They're different. But if I add them, what do I get? 2, two plus <laughs> something x plus <laughs> it's still a three term polynomial. That would be fine. That would be fine. Oof, that's bad. It's not closed. 
The whole point was, is that the first thing has to be a one. Well, one plus one is two. I can't. What about alpha? That would be an alpha. That wouldn't be. Well, if alpha was a one, <laughs> it would work. But alpha is not a one. It doesn't work. It's not closed. So it's not even closed on anything. So it's obviously not. I mean, any one of these would make it. It's not a subspace. Okay. Um, if we restrict ourselves to classic vector space for a second, which is normal vector vectors, why we even have the word? So I'll, we'll just take the normal vector space where I have nth dimensional vectors. So V is made up of V1, V2, down to Vn. So I have my normal vector V within nth dimensional space. So let's just consider these vectors for a second. One of the things that can happen, and we're going to think of subspaces within this space. So I'm going to normal, talk about normal physical space that we're used to thinking about, not polynomial space or matrix space or continuous functional space, just normal space for us. Two-dimensional, three-dimensional, four-dimensional, five-dimensional, however high we want to go. Now for that, one of the things we could imagine in our heads, if A is M by N and you multiply it by X, which is obviously N by 1, what's the thing that comes out? What's its size? M by 1. Looking at that for a second, that would mean that over here in nth dimensional space, there's an X that's in here. If I use matrix A to multiply by X, if I do an AX, what type of object comes out? B. But what space is he in? M space. Uh, if I wanted to physically consider that for a second. Let's say A was 3 by 2. Actually, go the other direction. Let's make it 2 by 3. What's a 2 by 3? What's a 2 represent? Rows. What's the three represent? Columns. Columns. So let's say I had one, zero, negative one, zero, one, two. Multiply this thing by x and it spits out a b. What's the dimension of x? Three. This is a three dimensional object. It's in R3. It's three by one. What's the dimension of b? Three by two. It's a two dimensional object. So what does this matrix act like? What this matrix is acting like is I could sit there and say that I have three-dimensional space. Take any vector I want within three-dimensional space, call it x, and then if I would take a times x, it's going to spit out some b, which by the way is in two-dimensional space. So this matrix acts like a mover. So I could sit there and say, hey, this room is three-dimensional. So if I, mul if I took any vector in this room that I want, like I can, if my feet is the origin, there's an arrow from my foot to the door that you leave. If I multiply it by this matrix, it would map it to, say, the board. It would say, hey, look. I'm going to take that and it moves to this matrix, this vector on the board. I go, what about, let's say we point that direction. Well, multiply it by A, it'll go to that place on the board. So this matrix acts as a mover. I can take one way, imagine every, this entire three dimensional room getting squashed by this matrix to go to this board. Is everybody okay with that? 
Now, one of the things that would sometimes interest us is, so this thing's acting like a mover. And why is this equation important to us? And may remember from the test? If it has only the trivial solution, what does it tell you about A? It's invertible. If you have more than that, it is not invertible. Whether the A inverse exists says, how many, how many solutions do I have on this guy? I'm get, I, know, I know A times zero is zero. Physically, what does that say? The origin always maps to the origin. For it to not be invertible would be, well, is there anybody else? What if there's another matrix, sorry, another vector that went to the origin? And then this vector went to the origin. And what about that vector goes to the origin? How many vectors go to the origin? And so one of the things that we would do is solving this becomes important. I always know this guy goes here. But on the other hand, if I had something else, that went there, that matrix is not going to have an inverse. It's going to be singular. And think about what, if this is a function, think about what that means. If this point goes to this point, but this vector here also goes there, and this vector also goes there, what's the whole point of the inverse? Can you go backwards? If I had a bunch of stuff go here, how do you go backwards? I don't know where you came from. I can't undo what you just did. There is no inverse. So we can imagine it's like, hey, it's a non-invertible function is one way we could talk about it. I can't go back. Everybody went there, so how I can't, I can't tell you where it goes. So what we're going to do is, let's go ahead and collect all x's such that ax equals zero. I know zero's in it, at least. I know it's not empty. But are there others? Let's go ahead and collect them, and we collect them into the same set. And so that set would be, all right, it's all, matrix, all vectors x such that ax is equal to zero, and we're gonna give this a name, and this is called n of a. Why is it called n of a? Because obviously a, is the thing that's doing the moving, so that, that's important. Why the N? The N stands for null. And so it takes it and turns it into, well, a nothing. So we call it null. Now, it has obviously the zero object is always here. Here's another question. If X went there, which meant that AX was equal to zero. If Y went there, that means it would be in this set. What about X plus Y? Where would he have to go? Well, is matrix multiplication distributed? Yes, so that is AX plus AY. But where is it? that's just zero plus zero, which is zero. It's closed. So if this guy went to zero and this guy went to zero and I added those two, that would also go to zero. Well, what about, well, if x goes to zero, what about alpha x? Matrix, scalar, matrix, right, in terms of operators, what can that scalar do? Go ahead and lift out, but what's that? In other words, if this guy mapped to zero, if I stretch him, he still maps to zero. So what does that tell you about this set? It's a subspace. And if it's a subspace, we're going to call it the null space. The null space is a sub. We give it, why is it null? Because it's everybody that goes to zero by A. Why is it space? 
because uh, it's a subspace. So we'll call it null space. So what we found is if you're in here and you're in nth dimensional space and you multiply things by a, and over here it goes to whatever m dimensional space it is, over here is a subspace which is n of a, that's my null space. This is a collection of everything that over here goes to this guy's zero object. So now for questions of inverse really comes down to this. If that has more than zero in it, then A can't be undone. It's non-invertible. If it only has the zero object, then A is invertible. So that's one thing that would be interesting to us. All right, let's go back to AX again. A can be considered this, that's A1, A2, up to AN times x1, x2, down to xn. So really, ax was thought of as, well, this is x1 times a1 plus x2 times a2 plus everything up to xn times an. And so a matrix times a vector acts as the columns of a being scalar multiplied and added. If I look at this for a second over here, what do I notice that every single one of those things deal with? The two operators of vector spaces. Because what is it? Scalar multiply, add. That's all we're doing. So that would look at this and say, well, this normal matrix times a vector is this idea of a linear combination. of A's columns. Well, let's generalize that. And so instead of saying that I have A, if we would generalize this, and just simply say, well, what if I had something times a vector, and then something times some other vector, and then something times some other vector, And obviously, this is going to be a vector. So what happens is, if I'm given a set of v1, v2, up to vn. Now, those n's are just arbitrary. Right? They actually could be, I could have five things, ten things, three things, a million things. Don't care. I just have a bunch of things. And what am I doing? I form a linear combination. One way of looking at this is to simply say, well, that means I take my vectors and I use my normal operators of my space, which is plus and scalar multiply. And then I just do it for every possible way that I could ever do it. In other words, if I would sit there and say, you fix these vectors, and then I allow you to stretch them and add them. If you do something like that, so if I had visually an example say using two vectors. Say you had vector v1 and then vector v2. What I then say is, hey, what can happen if you just simply stretch these things and add them? Well, what you've done is you form this grid world. This is all of these use. Every place you could ever get by simply adding these guys together somehow. 
And what we'll do is if go ahead and collect them all. And we will call that the span of V1, V2, Vn. So imagine these are like the building blocks of a bridge. You have this shape and this shape in these directions. And I simply say, oh, you can take any lengths in those directions and add them all together. It would create this entire lattice pattern. It's like, where can you all go? Collect all of that together, and that's called the span. And physically, when you look at it, it's like, yeah, it kind of looks like a span. Where do I all go? Now, spans are going to be vector spaces as well, and so it's a subspace. And it's itself is going to be a vector space, and it'll be a subspace of where you took it. Why? Is the zero object here? Yeah, what would I plug into for every one of the stretchings? Zero. <laughs> so the zero object's here. Well, why is it closed? I'm only using plus and times, <laughs> so it's obviously plus and times. I'm using this to work, so it's, it, the closure is going to work. And so this will be a subspace. So physically, what this looks like, so how about a theorem? If V1, V2, Vn are taken from a vector space, the span of these guys, which is where can you all go by adding and stretching these guys, is a subspace of that vector space. So now we have this sort of issue. If that's you. In here you collect, say, there's V1, there's V2, dot, 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 there's Vn and this entire thing being the span of V1, V2, up to Vn, is going to be a subspace within it. Which means that if we, what's definitely going to be here is obviously going to be the zero objects here. It's one of those things in it. Where can you all go? Um, let's take an example. If I was in three space, like this, and I took this vector, which would be 0, 2, 0, and I took, say, this vector, which would be, sorry, transpose, should have wrote it vertical, uh, would be 0, 1, 1, transpose it since I should have read it vertical. Any linear combination of these guys would look like what? What would the span look like? What do I do? I stretch the first guy. And then I stretch the second guy. What does that look like? Looks like that. Now, if I'm allowed to arbitrarily pick any possible number I ever want for alpha 1 and alpha 2, you know, if you're allowed to freely pick any alpha 1 or any alpha 2 you want, what would come out on that line? Anything, right? Because I take arbitrary number plus an arbitrary number is an arbitrary number. What comes out on the bottom? Anything, but what's the top? Zero. In other words, what will this thing spit out? Zero, something, something. What is that? It's the YZ plane. It's the plane behind the wall. So what this span is, this span, 
is the yz plane is equal to the span. Because there's no x value, it's just any y, any z, but x is always zero. That's the yz plane. And that's a subspace. Actually, if you would look at this, any plane in three-dimensional space that crosses through the origin is going to be a subspace. Okay. From that idea, Let's have a new idea. So I sit there and I look at this problem and I notice that if I'm in my space, if I take some vectors and I put them together, I'm going to get a span. Let's go back to the basis concept. The basis concept way back here at the beginning in terms of induction. What's the whole point that was of induction? You would start off with some sort of starting objects. Then you would have a rule to make new objects. So what's a span? It's this. We start off with the set, which is our starting elements. What's our rule for generating new things? Scalar multiplication addition. It's the normal stuff you do. So what's the span? what is made. So if I would look at this problem here, this set, what is your starting set? The number five. What was your role? Addition. So what was the span? That. It's everywhere you could possibly get. If we would have, you have your start, you follow your rule, what's the span? Everywhere you go. Now one of the things that would be interesting is, is it possible to have a space, so I have my vector space V, I take V1 and I take V2, and I take Vn, and then I form the span of V1. Where all can you go? And then the question would be, is it possible for the span of what you're dealing with to actually go everywhere. Rough concept. Let's go all the way back here. This rule formed multiples of fives. What would be the one modification you would do to make Let's say that this is a subspace, if I would look at it, of what if your entire space was just simply the, the integers themselves, which is you know, everything, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, etc. Right? The integers are just the counting numbers, from negative infinity to infinity. Obviously, this is a subset of that. It could be a subspace if we would have things, right? It's, it's within it. What would be the thing that you would change so that your span is the same. Instead of start at 5, what number should you start with? Start with 1. What do you have, the number 1? Well, how do I generate all numbers? For every number that you have, either add it to it or subtract it. And if I do that, I will generate everything from negative infinity to infinity. It would cover everybody. That's nice. Seems to, to work rather well to, to make it fit the entire world. So, using that idea, 
of can the span actually cover everything? If so, if you can find such a thing, if yes, we are going to call the thing that you found, the sets, to be a spanning set of your vector space. All right, so, so why is it doing that? Stop it. <coughs> example. My vector space I'm looking at is R3. Now my hope is to go everywhere. So if, if you're in R3, what would be anywhere in R3? A, B, C. <laughs> For some, it's like, where can you go? Something, something, something. What are those places? Anything, right? Some A, B, C, I don't know. So, for example, does, say, the vector 1, 1, 0, and the vector 0, 1, 0, and the vector 2, negative 1, 0, does this span R3? Well, how do I answer this question? It's like, well, how do you make a span? You take the first and you stretch it. You take the second and you stretch it. You take the third and you stretch it. You add those stretchings and it better go where? Everywhere. So somebody has fixed ABC for you. That's the everywhere, right? So is it possible for you to stretch those three vectors and go everywhere? Well, let's, let's check. Uh, what's the left-hand side? If I go ahead and hand, handle all those. This would be what? Alpha 1 plus 2 alpha 3s. What's the next one? Alpha 1 plus alpha 2 minus alpha 3. What's the bottom one? Zero. Zero. Is this possible? Does this, here comes the question, does this have a solution is really what we're asking. In other words, because somebody, somebody told you ABC, you got to figure out the stretchings. Is, can this be solved? If the answer is no, then no span. If the answer is yes, then we have a span. So the question is really this. Does this have a Solution. What type of problem is this? <coughs> right? It's a system of equations where A, B, and C are numbers. I'm just not going to tell you what it is. Can you solve systems of equations? Yes. How do you solve systems of equations? Augmented matrices, Gaussian elimination, substitution, elimination. We need to be able to solve systems of equations. Guess what? It's a tool. How are we going to do it? I need to solve this. Oh, look, solving this is a system of equations. I know how to solve system of equations. I actually use matrices to do it. But honestly, we look at it. What's the answer? No. Why? If C isn't zero, that has no solution. And so, no. So guess what? It doesn't span. Is everybody okay with that? Because it has to, here's the important part, it has to always have a solution. For any A, for any B, for any C, it must have a solution. Well, if C is zero, no, no it's not if C is zero. For all possible values of C, does this have a solution? No. So it does not span. Um, do, 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 do. What if I would have this? What about, we're still in R3. What if I did 1, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, and... 
One, two, three. So what am I going to have to check? Does alpha 1 times 1, 1, 0 plus alpha 2 times 0, 0, 1 plus alpha 3 times 1, 2, 3 go everywhere? In other words, what does this really become? So does the following system. Alpha 1 plus alpha 3 is supposed to be A. Alpha 1 plus 2 alpha 3 needs to be B. And alpha 2 plus 3 alpha 3s needs to be C. Have a solution. And you can have one or more. You can have one solution or an infinite number of solutions. Solve it. But it needs to be solvable for, in other words, what does it mean by solve? You need to be able to tell me what alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 are equal to. If you get numbers, Right? There'll be A, B's, and C's, but they're numbers, right? If you get something, has a solution. What if it has an well, if you have a free variable, then I have an infinite number of solutions. Hey, it has a solution. The answer is yes. It spans. 